Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Eugene Safanov. I'm part of the marketing team at Proficient, and I am super excited that you joined us for today's webinar, in which we'll discuss how organizational change management empower the adoption of Microsoft Teams for a customer with 15,000 employees. Before we move on to a brief overview of Proficient, I'd like to cover some basic housekeeping items. You are welcome to submit questions to our speaker, speakers at any time today. They will be addressed as time allows towards the end of the presentation. If you still have unanswered questions after the webinar, feel free to visit Proficient's website for our contact information or contact the speakers directly. Their email addresses will be in the presentation. I will also include the contact information for our organizational change management chief strategist, David Chapman. Please note that today's webinar is being recorded and will be sent to you within a few days. All right, so a little bit about Proficient. So Proficient is a leading global digital consultancy. We imagine, create, engineer, and run digital transformation solutions that help our clients exceed customer expectations, outpace competition, and grow their business. With strategy, creative, and technology capabilities, we really bring big thinking and innovative ideas, along with a practical approach to help the world's largest enterprises and biggest brands succeed. We have a broad network of locations across the US, as well as nearshore and offshore facilities in India, China, Colombia, Mexico, and Serbia. Founded in 1997, we're a public company with more than 4,500 employees. And we formed strategic partnerships with many of the major technology vendors and have dedicated solution and industry practices as well. So uh, one of these solution practices is organizational change management. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, there you go. Um, while some consulting companies have organizational change management groups, the fact that we do it well is a differentiator in itself. I'm not going to cover the information on the slide here in detail, since our presenters will go into it a little bit later about what the practice does. but feel free to review it once you receive the deck via email all right uh, about our speakers so today we have three wonderful speakers we have andres gonzalez who is a lead business consultant in our organizational change management practice as well as meglin ashe who is a lead business consultant in our organization organizational change management practice as well and finally, we have Ryan Coburn, who is a senior project manager in our management consulting group. So uh, at this point, I'd like to turn the call over to Andres Gonzalez. Andres? All right, great. Thank you for that great introduction, Eugene. All right, again, my name is Andres Gonzalez, and thank you for joining today's webinar. Uh, today, we're going to cover three important topics around change management. We'll start with a brief basic overview, including our methodology for managing change. In that first bit, we'll talk about why OCM should become a part of arguably any workplace change you're doing that involves your people behaving differently or working in new ways or ways that are new for them. So our last two topics will cover how change management enabled the enterprise-wide adoption of a new technology, particularly Microsoft Teams. My colleague Ryan will talk about our recent client and their request for change management. And he'll also mention some of the unexpected obstacles we faced due to COVID-19 and the current pandemic. Lastly, Meglin will share the change management solutions we provided that helped overcome these unexpected hurdles and not only led to positive adoption for Microsoft Teams, but organizational impacts that put an underline on the importance of change management, even for wider parts of the organization. Of course, we'll be able to uh, leave some time at the end for questions, so stick around for those if you have any for us today. All right, so let's talk about change management basics for a few minutes. So as the title of this slide says, that incredible sports car that you're seeing on the right side of your screen. Now, as amazingly built as it looks, that sports car in reality can only go as fast and efficiently as the person who's driving it, right? 
Uh, I think it's a solid metaphor for technology implementations and OCM in general. The caption that you're seeing on the slide right there is a stat pulled from ProSci. So in case you haven't heard of ProSci, they are a leading organization in change management principles. Their book on OCM best practices says that two thirds of projects ultimately fail to meet business objectives and desired return on their investments. The interesting thing about this is it's usually not for reasons like the technology is poorly built or that something went missing in designs. Uh, typically that's something that we get right. The cause for failure is that something usually did go missing in terms of adoption and getting people to use the new technology the way that you want them to or to its full capabilities. Not getting your people to reach that full potential makes me think of someone who spends a ton of money on a sports car, right? And only ever drives that vehicle in like a 30 miles per hour school zone or a residential neighborhood or something below 30 miles per hour. Now, if you ask me, that's kind of a loss on that big investment on such an amazing vehicle in my book. So when we talk about change management and especially for digital transformations, we're focused less on the technology. Like I said, we typically get that right, but we're more focused on the getting the people and getting the people ready, willing, and able to actively engage and fully adopt with that new technology. So as the slide says, a flawless technology is just that first part. And like I said, with the sports car analogy, as far as a flawless technology solution goes, I and mean, I'd say Microsoft Teams categorizes as a very solid sports car. It's, it's an efficient platform. It integrates well with so many other work applications. And it provides a great end user experience for whoever's using that tool. But again, the technology is just one factor. And like you'll see in the next slide, if you only focus on the surface level chat or call features of Microsoft Teams and don't get don't invest in your people actively engaging with the tool and embracing the full Microsoft Teams potential, you're missing on 70 to 80% of your overall investment there. And that sports car that you have is really not being put to great use when the designs are more than able to do so much more. So here it is on the slide. It's circled right there. And knowing that 70 to 80% of ROI is driven by the people side of change, that's where OCM starts to become a lot less of what people typically call a soft discipline or a nice to have for your project. and becomes an effort that project success starts to depend on. So if you have, if you can think back to maybe any previous implementations, that you were a part of or that you can look back on, maybe ask, you know, did your team invest in the people side? Did they invest in active change management to help your people understand why they were getting these new tools? And was it done in a way that got them excited about it instead of dreading the day that that tool becomes available? And did they have the proper resources and training to, to teach them to use their new tech the right way once it arrived? Now that's where the success is up to six times more likely to achieve the results that you wanted from the beginning. Okay, and as you'll see on this slide, a lot of that occurs by minimizing disruption for your project, um, your people, and ultimately the business overall. And it's true if you've heard this before, anything that involves someone to either change an old habit or an established way of doing things, that's always gonna cause some disruption and some level of productivity to go down at the very start. So the question is not necessarily, how do I eliminate that disruption entirely for that person? But it's always gonna happen if there's any change in behavior going on. But after we've launched on day one, as this chart is showing here, how do I make sure that I have the right OCM activities set up where it takes people a lot less time to bounce back from that performance disruption? And as the chart is showing right here, not only bounce back, but start to excel as intended, start to really go beyond the performance they initially had. Because with, without that support, as the right side of this chart is showing, like, you know, transformation without OCM activities, you know, that steeper decline in performance and that longer recovery due to disruption, unfortunately, starts to take a lot more time. And that's a lot more likely for your business than if you had the left side of that chart that's showing the transformation with well-executed OCM activities. So here's, how, uh, here's an overview of how we do it. Now, there are multiple models for change management, as you may be aware. Uh, ProSci, I mentioned them earlier, they have their own model called ADCAR. There's Lewin's three-step or Cotter's eight-step model, and they're great if you're familiar with them. Uh, most, if not all, change management models typically follow a similar direction. But here's our methodology for managing change at Proficient. Now, 
I'm not going to read this entire slide, but I do think it's important to say that this approach has four intentional phases that make sure that our change management plans aren't one size fits all or the same for every client each time. And as the bold line below in our slide right there says, our methodology is pragmatic and iterative. And that means that we use specific phases to create the best change management approach, approach that fits business and stakeholder needs. So we, we walk through these phases sort of as gargoyles as we go through the overall OCM approach. And we always start with the defined phase to understand project objectives. We talk about the benefits of the project and we start to build our case for change and that case for change sets the foundation for our OCM activities. The case for change is where we outline, we start to define why are we doing this project? Why is it important for maybe executives? And just as importantly, what's in it for end users that's gonna get them to buy into this new tool? So whenever we can clearly and concisely define these key messages for the project, we can move to what, arguably I think is the most important piece of our defined phase, which is validating it with our audience. So that's where we socialize the case for change. We start to discuss the why that we defined and we start to socialize it with key stakeholders and get their perspective. You know, do they agree with why we're doing this project? Are the benefits that we outline things that they care about and are they excited or ready to change? And lastly, you know, what do they need in terms of communications and training in order to be prepared to achieve those benefits that we talked about? So once we get our audience's perspective, that's when we can and probably should adjust our case for change. That way we actually have that key messaging of why we're doing this and, and make it relevant for end users and have it really best fit audience needs. So again, as, as I mentioned, our methodology is pragmatic, as pragmatic and it's iterative. That information from our stakeholder analysis, that makes our case for change very solid and very effective. And the great info that we have in the case for change and the information that we get from stakeholders when we validate it with our audience, that feeds into our next three phases where we lead communication, uh, where we enable users to use the new tool, and where we build some sustained activities to really make it stick in the organization. So as we'll talk about in our Microsoft Teams implementation in just a moment, we had some unexpected obstacles this year, right? As many of us did with our own work. And, that, and when that happens, that's when it's critically important to understand your stakeholder audiences that, that are engaging with this change and that your change management plan can reasonably adapt accordingly. Because it's not that that derails your project and your efforts to help your people get ready and willing to adopt that new solution, uh, it, it starts to have those complications. So we'll talk about that in just a moment uh, as we talk about the current Microsoft Teams implementation that we are going to discuss. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, the what I would have to say is that iteration and change were definitely themes for this project. The uh, uh, with the end of life for Skype for Business, our client, which was a Fortune 500 uh, utility provider with over 40 million customers, they saw an opportunity to get ahead of the change along with leveraging the power of teams that significantly transform the way that the business worked and collaborated. So our client had rolled out Skype for Business a few years ago. This was maybe 2017, 2018. And with that rollout, it was seen as essentially ineffective. Not that it was ineffective technically, and technically it was a success, but the overall adoption and usage was significantly below their expectations. There was a lack of communication, essentially a lack of change management and, um, that drove a, a lack of awareness about the why Skype for Business should be adopted within the organization. There was a lack of excitement to make the change and, and a lack of adequate training and reinforcement that did not leave the employees ready, willing, and able to use the tool. So not only was Skype for Business underutilized as a communication tool, the rollout left users continuing to use other platforms and tools which were unsupported and often even unknown by the IT organization. So Proficient was brought in to contribute our expertise with using Microsoft Teams and leading change efforts to ensure that Teams for our client did not become another Skype. Go ahead. New slide, there you go, all right. The, uh, and I, th I think that what is most important or impactful about this project was that it was really a transformation in the way that the client worked. In today's work and business environment, 
chats, calls, and meetings functionality is really table stakes, all right? That's the ticket for entry for any type of communication tool. So what the client software itself and, and what Teams would bring is a way to provide this basic functionality along with the features and functionality to transform the way in which the company operated and how employees would interact with each other. As you can see on the bottom of the iceberg, the features and functionality were you know, the greater benefit and, and those weren't necessarily being utilized within the limited pilot project that had been put in place. Um, our team worked with them, our client overall, to get the, these features and functionality fully utilized and to enable the, the client to bring about a new way of working by creating teams specific to their function or interest, and then also being able to share and collaborate on documents and, and also project management, which teams brought to the client. What was interesting though, is not only did this functionality available the company to interact across, you know, across all groups and, and across business units, but it provided the functionality for this utility company to remain compliant with FERC regulations and prohibit some areas of the company from communicating with themselves or with each other. Um, so that was something that, that, that talks to the, the dynamics of this application. So go ahead. And as Andres mentioned, this project certainly had its unexpected uh, challenges. Um, you know, it was mid-March when this project was kicking off, and I'm sure all of us can remember way back then uh, about what was going on. Yeah, it's Thursday we were getting ready to fly out to the client uh, the coming Monday, and on Friday the announcement came out that everyone would be working from home. Interestingly enough, normally this type of project would be conducted face-to-face -face and in person. So we pivoted to a virtual project, and it was something that had not been considered and would require an additional series of pivots to ensure the project was successful. So being thrust in this work environment literally overnight heightened the need to accelerate the project. The time, initial timeline was after a, a relatively linear communication plan, the training and then rollout, the company, uh, which was expected to roll out in August. Um, with everybody working from home now, the need to have a solution immediately now created the first pivot to shorten the timeline considerably from uh, launch in August to starting the project and, and wrapping that up, um, and wrapping that up in, in just a, a couple of months in the mid-June from when we initially started. Um, we launched half of the employees, followed a week later by another half of the company, so roughly 7,500 to 8,000, one week and 7,500 to 8,000 the next week. Uh, what this necessitated was an accelerated iterative training plan as changes to features and functionality were being turned on and off at the same time that we were delivering the trainings. So these trainings or these changes also required iteration in our communications to get ahead of changes or at least acknowledge that changes had happened and why they are being implemented for the business reasons um, were being communicated. So the second one, the second pivot was being 100% virtual. Typically, as I mentioned before, we would have developed all this in person and face-to-face. Um, and they also be able to do drive-bys at, at someone's uh, desk and have ad hoc conversations. The pivot we made was to highly utilize teams to create a new way of working. Fortunately, we are all in the same boat when it came to the need and desire to find a new way of working. The silver lining was that in this environment, it generated the need and we found the client highly, highly receptive to using teams. And in some cases we found leaders were expressing frustration that their counterparts were still using Skype and not moving fast enough. The third pivot was in navigating the business unit structure. This large utility company was divided up into three different business units. Um, you know, and, and so we had a level of communication that was, um, you know, certainly there was autonomous business units. And each one of these units had its own communications department, and our conduit to those groups was a single IT communications representative. These individual communications departments could completely rewrite a communication or send a communication based on their own calendar and timeline outside of the timeline and calendar and the intent that we had set as a, as a, as a team. So 
Given this and the perception of also of email fatigue due to an increase in overall communication uh, and the number of communications that were being pushed through email, our team sought out alternative, alternative ways to drive the communications deployment. We turned to leveraging uh, new ways of communicating, leveraging managers and directors uh, to discuss teams in their meetings and also enrolled other departments with a broad reach within the company to deliver messaging and create new ways in which the client could support itself. So I don't want to get into that too much because I'm going to turn it over to Megalyn who will touch on that here. Thanks, Ryan. So now you may be asking, how did we do it? How were we successful despite these challenges Ryan just mentioned? While our OCM approach definitely laid the foundation for success, and of course we tailor our solution to meet each client's needs, you may have found by now that successful change is more than just checking the boxes. It has to be a strategic approach and flexible as conditions are changing throughout the project. So what you see here are four, comp four main components of how we applied our methodology that really contributed to our success. The first is understanding your audience. Then we have leveraging existing mediums of communication, using teams to teach teams, and empowering users to sustain the change. Now I'll take a deeper dive into each of these points, but first let's discuss understanding your audience. All right, so understanding your audience's needs by conducting a stakeholder analysis. So. Andres mentioned earlier, we have our defined phase of the project where we really define the change and how it affects, how it's going to affect stakeholders. But going a step further than that in our approach, we take time to conduct a thorough stakeholder analysis to really analyze our audience's needs and understand the people side of the change. So for this client, we started with an exercise with the project team to determine the impacted stakeholder groups. Something important to note though, is that we are often brought in by IT, the IT organization. So it can take some time to really dig into the other stakeholder groups outside of IT or out of the IT bubble. This is truly an iterative process. From there, we usually meet with individual stakeholder groups as we did with this project. And we have conversations while learning more about each group and ask questions and really understand the specific needs of each stakeholder group. From there, with this project, we determined three main audiences with different needs. Now, the three primary audiences were our phase one, or our pilot users, our phase two users, which was the rest of the organization, and then our executive assistants, or those in need of white glove training. So, the first audience was our phase one pilot users, which was an entirely IT based audience of about 170 users. What we learned from our IT audience is that they were already pretty familiar with the tool. They had it rolled out previously in a, uh, a previous pilot they had uh, tried to undergo. And they were really curious more about the advanced features that teams have to offer, really the rich or hidden collaboration features within the platform, since they were already familiar with the tool. Now, through stakeholder analysis, we knew that wouldn't be the case for phase two. Through our stakeholder interviews and our conversations with the other stakeholder groups outside of IT, we realized this approach couldn't be a one size fits all or that non-IT users would need to focus on the basic functionality first. They had to walk before they could run. Now the third group was our executive assistant or executive admins. These are always an important or influential group within an organization. So we always take the time to meet with these groups and really understand their needs within that organization. What we found with the executive assistance at this client, we knew that we needed to condense their training approach. They needed a lot to learn a lot about the application, a lot of material, but they didn't have a lot of time to actually attend training. So we needed to consider condensing uh, a lot of our training into a, a curriculum that was suited best for them. 
Once we determined our audience's needs, then we were able to really define our communication approach. All right, so we leveraged existing mediums of communication. So the goal with our communication phase of the project is really to socialize the case for change, the key benefits of the project, what's in it for me, for the stakeholder groups, and other strategic information, such as that tactical information with the project, go live dates, migration information. But as Brian mentioned, we had some challenges throughout the pandemic. We couldn't just use our traditional communication methods. Those were unavailable to us. So some examples of this are limited emails. Our capacity to send emails was very limited. The organization was sending out organization-wide emails every day with updates on the pandemic and the virtual work environment. There also is no physical office space to go to anymore. So no physical communication mediums such as posters, uh, in-person lunch and learns or hallway conversations weren't an option. So we needed to be flexible and creative with our approach without completely reinventing the wheel. Since time was of the essence, we needed to communicate and train and we needed to do it quickly. So we did utilize email. Uh, some organizations might try checking the box by sending a few emails, but our approach is much more involved than that. We did reserve that inbox space for really the necessary tactical communication. So communications about go live, training registration, things that really needed to go out in an email um, as, one, as one communication method. We did have more flexibility with smaller audiences, such as our pilot audience. So we leveraged that as we could. But again, email space was very valuable. So we needed other communication methods. So the client had some existing communication mediums that we wanted to leverage. The first was SharePoint. The client had an existing SharePoint site created for Teams, but we really took ownership of this site and built it out into a one-stop shop for our project information. So we promoted the site throughout our training sessions, throughout any email we sent out, and we included as much information on the site as we could to get that information and training out quickly. We had migration information, timelines, communication updates, so tech tips, tech alerts. We posted messages from the um, CIO, support information, and anything and everything Teams training related. Everything from training registration, course information, and then the self-paced resources such as recordings and and job aids. The third communication we leveraged was Yammer. Now Yammer was an existing communication medium for the company already. If you're not familiar with Yammer, it's kind of like a social media platform where, or like a, a social media Twitter for an organization. Now, a few hundred people had already been using this Microsoft Teams info Yammer, and we wanted to leverage that and reach as many many different audiences as we could if for their preferred communication style. So we would cross post the information that we would share in emails and our SharePoint site. We used Yammer as another medium for that communication. And lastly, and most importantly, was our Teams user community. Now, our ultimate, ultimately our goal for communications is to drive adoption to the new technology and keep users informed on what's going on. We wanted to direct users to Teams as much as possible to accomplish that. So we created a Teams user community, basically a, a team within the platform itself, as a forum for users to ask and answer questions to their peers, similar to Yammer, but much more integrated and interactive within the tool itself. So we organized the user community into several channels, such as tips and tricks, troubleshooting, how do I, and team owner best practices. Those are some examples. We built out the Yammer, I'm sorry, we built out the Teams user community um, from scratch and we started with 170 pilot users. And then we opened it up to the larger organization for phase two. And we did that intentionally. We knew that the pilot users were going to be an important 
audience to help us facilitate the change and sort of act as a change champion for the rest of the organization. So we started out with 170 pilot users who again, were really IT focused and wanted to leverage their existing knowledge of the tool to help their peers for the phase two employees, the rest of the organization. Now, the Teams user community was great because it required users to learn the tool um, to interact and benefit from it. We also integrated applications within the tool. So everything you see here, the SharePoint site, the Yammer that was already existing, and any emails we would create as posts within the community to make sure we are reaching all of our audiences and keep users going back to the tool and going back to that community as a single source of truth. Now, encouraging users to use the application from the beginning helps flatten the learning curve. And that brings us to our next component, which is our training approach. Using Teams to teach Teams. Now, this is a huge portion of our training strategy. Remember, our, train, our traditional hands-on or in-person methods were not an option at this point during the pandemic. So it was crucial to provide the knowledge and resources needed for users to feel comfortable incorporating the new technology into their daily work and into their daily work at home from a virtual environment. The collaboration or a virtual collaboration tool was important now more than ever. So we really had to reflect here and pivot with this virtual method of training and really ask ourselves, how do we engage a virtual audience? And we did that through a couple ways. We did this through two methods primarily. So the first is instructor-led training via live events. So what you're seeing here on the left is a live event. This is actually from one of our training courses. Now, Teams live events were great because it kept users in the tool. They had to learn the tool to participate in the event. Hundreds of users could join the a training session at once. While we had several session options, we needed to get a lot of users through training quickly to, accept for, to accommodate that accelerated timeline. On the right-hand side of this image, you'll see a Q&A section. So we wanted to keep the training as interactive as possible, but also accommodate a large audience. So fortunately, live events have a Q&A section where users can ask questions throughout their training and we were able to answer questions and keep that level of engagement, although the training was still virtual and high attendance. The second method was our self-paced resources. So this was training recordings, short video clips. Uh, we had tech tips. And what was great about the self-paced aspect of the training is that this allowed users to practice on their own time or go back and reference these materials in the future if they weren't able to make a training session or maybe they weren't ready for this material yet. This all happened very quickly. Going back to our stakeholder analysis, this our stakeholder analysis really provided the guidance we needed to develop our training approach. So you'll see here we have a leveled approach. And what that means is that we start at the top with a level one basic overview training and going all the way down to our level three advanced training with several courses in each. Now our level one basic overview training was really an orientation to the tool and its capabilities and also served as a pre-migration training. So what's happening to Skype? How is Teams going to work for me and my, my work needs? Now, in between our level one and level two trainings, that's when migrations and go live dates were happening. And this is when users were becoming more comfortable with the tool. They now had to use the tool. They didn't have Skype as another option to fall back on. So users were in the tool and that's really what set value to have our training, to have continued training after our level one overview training. In our level two and three courses, we took a deeper dive into specific features. So for instance, our level two courses, we had some extra training on meetings and team owner best practices, things that we couldn't touch on in that level one course, but we know that users had questions on. And then our level three training, this was the last trainings we conducted about a month or so, a month or two after go live. 
we took a deeper dive into those advanced settings of the platform, the customizations, app integrations, and most importantly, ways to communicate and collaborate effectively within the tool and not just using the tool as a new Skype, but a new way of working. Now, this approach addressed all of our audience's training needs that we heard in our stakeholder analysis and gave an opportunity for users to pick and choose what courses they thought fit them and really provided them that digestible curriculum at their own pace. So to recap our approach here, we use the tool to teach, or we use the tool to teach the tool. So we use Teams to teach Teams, and this really increased adoption at a quick pace. Second is we address all of our audience's needs in this leveled approach and this avoided disruption of business activities while also increasing productivity in the long run. But what really makes our approach unique is that most organizations focus on training up front before migration, getting users prepared, giving an overview. But again, what makes our approach so unique here is the timing of the training. So our approach was different because most of our training occurred after go live. Those level two and level three courses were after go live up to one month, two months after go live. So that really continued the encouragement of users to keep using the tool, keeping up the momentum and that desire to learn more on how to incorporate teams into their daily work. And this set us up for our foundation for sustainment, which is our next topic. Empowering users to sustain this change. So a lot of times as change managers were asked, how do you make change stick? And the answer is to set up an ongoing culture of learning. Now, we did this in a couple ways. The first is our support model. So while we continued training after go live, we had that Teams user community set up and we monitored it. We also had another aspect to our support model, which was office hours. For our office hours, we kept this as an open forum for users to come and ask questions, uh, to be served as a tutorial, really anything that the users wanted or needed help with, whether it's technical, something simple, where do I find these resources? We had an open bridge every day for about a month and a half or two months straight for users to fall back on as their support and as they're still learning the tool to become self-sufficient. Now, users came to office hours with more and more complex questions each day, whether it be more managerial, soft kind of training, such as someone becoming a manager and needs to create a team, and they just want help with the best way to structure their teams and channels, or more complex technical questions, such as how do I integrate applications how do I set up and configure this application into the tool? And how can I customize my team to, for specific use cases? We saw users wanting to use the tool more and more. The second is building relationships and really bringing together pieces of the organization. Now, internal IT hadn't really done a great job with this until we stepped in of really making those relationships throughout the organization outside of IT, getting out of the IT bubble. So we did this by bringing together IT and the organizational effectiveness team. Now, if you're wondering what that is, organizational effectiveness or organizational development teams are usually within an organization that supports ongoing learning initiatives or ongoing learning and development for their employees. So creating this alliance and bringing these two groups together really help develop that culture of change and that culture of, of learning moving forward. An example of this is that the organizational effectiveness team had some training that was already occurring, such as training on the business side. So really focused on the business side of training for teams meetings and how to have effective meetings. Now we wanted to help in build a gap and incorporate more technical components in their training. So we worked on ways that we can do that and really bridge the gap between the business side and the technical side on how to best use the tool to be more productive. 
And we began to point people to them for the desire to learn more. People kept asking, are we going to learn about this topic? I would like to learn more about this application integration. And we began to send these topics over to the organizational effectiveness team in hopes that they would take that information and support the ongoing learning and development within the tool for teams. So providing all of these resources, we saw growing competence each week in end users. And this really provided a foundation for success on this project and future success. But what did success look like for us? So let's take a look at our results. All right, so 15,000 users trained and enabled. 35,000 training site visits. So I mentioned that tr SharePoint training site earlier. If you look at the numbers here, 15,000 users, 35,000 training site visits over a couple months time. We feel very accomplished with this, that end users were not only visiting the site once, but they were going back to that site as a resource where they knew where to go to for answers to their questions, uh, whether it be training, support resources. But then when you look at our service desk calls, less than 10 service desk calls on the day of go live. Now we're really proud of this, this number here because this indicates that we not only limited the call volume for service desk calls, the client had told us that this actually was lower than their normal amount of service desk calls for any other given Monday. But this indicated that the resources we were providing in users not only helped them avoid disruption of their business activities, but they knew where to go for help and they felt confident enough to, to really take it upon themselves, the, the self-help, whether it be viewing their own training, or maybe asking a question in the Teams user community instead of calling the help desk. But OCM is more than just the numbers. We teach organizations to fish. Now, you may be familiar with the saying, if you give someone a fish, you feed them for a day. But if you teach someone to fish, you feed them for a lifetime. And that's exactly what we did on this project. We created a culture of change or that foundation for long-term success, not just in this initiative, but future initiatives. We also provided resources for users to become self-sufficient and have the awareness, desire, and ability to find answers to their questions on their own without calling the help desk and really empower them to use the tool and, and learn by using. We also increased the appetite for change. And users, as they would come to our office hours, we knew that they wanted to learn new ways of doing things. They, they wanted to become more productive. They wanted to use Teams any way they could to increase their productivity and not just treat it as an old Skype. And lastly, we created those lasting relationships within the company. So we created that alliance between the technical IT teams and the employee development or organizational effectiveness teams. And this is going to benefit them in future initiatives when they're rolling out new technology and for ongoing learning and development activities, not just for teams, but for future technology, future, future initiatives. That relationship is now established. So all that said, investing in change management is investing not only in the success of your current project, but in future initiatives. And with that, we'll go ahead and open up for questions. Awesome. Thank you, Meglin. Uh, so at this point, if you have any questions, feel free to enter them in the questions feature on the screen. And uh, we had a couple that we can just go through. Um, so the first question is, how big was the change management team that was focused on this particular project? Oh, that's a great question, especially ending on that last slide. Um, I would say the 
uh, overall change management team was pretty large, but the amount of change management resources that we have for proficient were about two to three people um, throughout the entire project. But what's interesting about this, and it's kind of good for the last slide that we just had and, and the methodology that we talk about, um, we also, proficient is a great way of partnering with the client in order to have the change management resources that yes, we lead the change effort, but also being able to have different key stakeholders within the client help your change team grow and have a bigger impact in your project. So the short answer is we had a few people, but our project, our change project, uh, change management project team grew as we started to go throughout the project. So when we did stakeholder analysis, we identified who were the directly impacted end users, the ones that were actually going to be using the tool directly, and who are ones that are impacting the project uh, and the overall implementation indirectly. And in that, we found people like communication liaisons, uh, training, IT training resources, people that have the capability and some of the bandwidth to be a resource for our project and start to create some of that culture of change within the within the organization. So it was really great to partner with this client because we were able to make such a big impact on you know 15,000 users by having a few change management resources kind of lead the initiative, but also partnering with individual people who can start to create certain aspects of the project, you know, creating communications, delivering communications, um, finalizing certain parts of training or sending out uh, registrations. You know, that, that's the part where the client can start to take some ownership of that and not have to invest so much in having so many change manager resources from proficient in order to complete it. Um, you're getting that to be a part of your business and start doing that. So I would say that we started with you know a few key change management resources, but that grew into a larger project team. The other thing I'd mentioned is with the with the user community that we talked about with the with the pilot team, we had IT people, the 170 people that started the user community. As Meglin mentioned, I mean those became people that were great change champions that were advocating the change. We didn't have a massive Un, uh, unmanageable need for support. If people had questions, they could go to that user community. People who have been in that user community for a while reference them. And we started to get, get more power users from the client, uh, as well as other resources that we leveraged. The organizational effectiveness team, the communications, as I mentioned, there were also training resources. So it starts to become a, a, a really established effort. And I, that, I think that really stems from the stakeholder analysis. Awesome, thank you. Uh, next question, at what levels did you interact with? Yeah, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, so in any change management effort, um, especially as we, we would go through with, say, the stakeholder analysis, to get the organization moving in the direction that you want, you really need to be um, driving that awareness, you really need to drive, you know, the ability and, and, you know, certainly the desire within the organization. And so to do that, not only are you interacting with folks at the, the junior levels with the organization or the line levels of the organization, but you want to take into account the vision and the risks and opportunities and um, what the outcomes are going to be or expected to be from the executives so that you can drive their message down and be like what Andres was saying, where our client, you know, we are able to leverage our client to be a force multiplier for the work that we were doing. We can be that force multiplier for the executives within that organization. And so we worked with uh, the gamut from executives, uh, EVPs, all the way down to individuals at the call center level to understand what their considerations were around the project and what um, what they needed to get to move from that awareness and desire to actually being able to take on this new uh, this new way of working awesome thank you uh, the next question uh, were there any downsides to doing virtual trainings versus in-person uh, trainings? Yeah, I'll take that one. So I think that's a great question. And while 
that was definitely one of our concerns stepping into the project. I think our foundation really set us up in a good place. Uh, we, we've done projects like this before where they're in an, an entirely virtual environment, you know, pre-COVID. So I think we were confident that we could make it work. Now, as far as downsides, I think we really alleviated those in our approach by providing as much engagement as possible, although it was a virtual environment. It wasn't, you know, ideally hands-on training as we would have liked, everyone being in a room, uh, people walking around, and and being able to assist users through the tool. Um, but we, we set it up to where, while users couldn't necessarily click along during the training, they had an opportunity, several opportunities to attend the training multiple times, come back and ask questions, come to office hours and ask questions. They could share their screen. We would share their our screens with them and we would walk them through just as, as we could in person. So we did our best to really supplement that virtual experience, um, and although it couldn't be done hands-on. We also provided those resources, the self-paced training resources for users to go back to. Maybe they weren't ready uh, for training. Um, so even into the future, they could go back and reference those and learn on their own time as, which kind of mimics what, what users would have experienced in a virtual environment, I'm sorry, in a in-person environment. Yeah, I actually like that Megan really mentioned that because that, that is true with our training approach. I mean, people learn the new tool, the new technology in different ways. Some people prefer instructor led. Some people prefer to go read uh, helpful articles or instructions. We were able to provide a lot that was, uh, you know, Teams is a, a pretty set to, uh, tool or technology. It's not going to be completely different between organizations. There are differences between organizations, but they're not entirely different. So in terms of training, there are, you know, Microsoft and Brainstorm, uh, they provide a lot of useful videos and helpful self-paced resources for you to go and, and look for different questions or, different, or specific answers that you're looking for. So people leveraged our training and our support resources in different ways, which was great. And for our virtual training, we had, you know, a few people that would maybe lead the training, kind of similar to how we're doing this uh, webinar now. And we had other people who would also, uh, they were part of IT, part of the client's IT, and they would help us facilitate maybe the Q&A. They would ask, answer questions that they already knew the answer to. And it started to become a, a better effort. And as Brian mentioned, that started, started to multiply our impact. Awesome, thank you. So at the moment, we don't have any more questions. Um, so I think this is a good place to, to stop the actual presentation. Uh, you know, if you do have additional questions, feel free to um, contact us. Uh, you can find out the contact information on Proficient's website, or you can contact David Chapman directly. His information is in the uh, in the chat. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank everyone for joining today's webinar. I'd like to thank our presenters as well. We hope that all of you found it very helpful. And uh, we look forward to you joining future webinars. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of the day and evening.